All right, uh, hello and welcome back to online English class. Uh, today is Monday, March 30th. All right, uh, so I hope you had a great weekend. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump back into our content for the week. Uh, but before we do that, let's take a look at the top of the week announcements that are going to organize uh, the tasks that are in front of you over the course of the next few days. Okay, so first of all, remember uh, your reading check for chapter 18, Sound is Meaning. Uh, your reading of the Dickinson poem, I Heard a Fly Buzz When I Died, and uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins' sonnet, God's Grandeur. All, of, uh, all this needs to be read and emailed to me by 3 p.m. today. All right, uh, so here's what we're going to be working on throughout the course of this week. First of all, if you're an AP, you need to finish your Unit 4 prog progress check by uh, Tuesday, March 31st. All right, remember uh, to be working diligently on those. Uh, to be working very carefully on those because those are going to uh, offer you a kind of one-to-one -one, uh, preparation for what your exam uh, after the pivot from the College Board is going to be like. Okay, so it's going to be a 45-minute uh, test. It's going to ask you to develop critical readings of both poetic passages and prose passages. All right, so um, we're going to be finishing up this particular unit. Uh, that's going uh, that is exploring uh, the craft, the skill of reading poetry closely. All right, uh, in preparation for that exam, and also in preparation for um, the test that you're going to be taking in this class, in this particular class, um, in the next couple weeks. All right, so uh, we need to complete OTN four, which is a figurative language analysis of two Dickinson poems. Today we're going to work through the second one. Much madness is divinest sense. All right, we're going to listen to and engage with the content of Lecture 6, uh, which is about sound, all right, sound devices in poetry. Uh, we are going to work on OTN 5, uh, which is about one uh, Dickinson poem, I Heard a Fly Buzz When I Died. Uh, and then we're going to listen to and engage with the content of Lecture 7, uh, which is going to be about rhythm and meter, stuff that you haven't probably uh, thought about since 10th grade, uh, if you went to 10th grade here. All right, uh, so what do you need to read? Uh, this week, you have some uh, uh, quite a bit of prose reading to do as we're trying to pack in uh, this content after, our, um, after the week that we kind of got cut out of our schedule because of the extended spring break. You need to read chapter 19, uh, chapter 20, and chapter 21, uh, all of which need to be completed by next Monday. And then one sonnet, uh, and this is kind of a throwback. You've probably read this. Uh, if you went to, if you took Honors English 2 or regular English 2 here, uh, which is the William Wordsworth sonnet, The World is Too Much With Us Late and Soon. Okay, so it's a uh, super well-constructed sonnet that we'll be talking about uh, perhaps um, in the weeks uh, and days to come. All right, so by the end of this week, you need to have OTN 4 and 5 done. Remember, if you're in AP, the AP course, you need to write one of your analysis of the Dickinson poems in OTN 4 in prose. OTN 5, you can write simply as class notes, okay? Because I don't want to overload you uh, with those little mini essay assignments. Uh, you just have to do one, okay? Uh, remember also, once again, to complete your Unit 4 progress check by Tuesday, March 31st. That's tomorrow. Uh, in terms of ongoing assignments, uh, continue reading King Lear. Make sure you have that finished uh, in the next uh, couple weeks. Uh, we're going to be uh, working on King Lear in the final section, uh, in the final unit. Uh, of the course, and uh, you also need to complete your MWE for the road. Okay, uh, again, this is an AP only assignment. If you complete it as an Honors English 4 student, uh, you will receive extra credit on a substantial assignment. Okay, so it won't be like, you know, one free reading check grade. It will be a substantial amount of uh, extra credit that will alter an essay grade or a test grade uh, in some way that's going to positively affect your grade in a notable way. All right, so uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into OTN4, uh, which we're going to be finishing today. All right, so the prompt for OTN4, uh, we've already completed our analysis of My Life Had Stood, A Loaded Gun, uh, which we talked about uh, in two different class periods on Thursday and Friday. Today we're going to be looking uh, in one class period at the short poem, Much Madness is Divinest Sense, all right, with an emphasis on the ways in which Dickinson uses figurative language, specifically uh, a, a, fig, uh, a figure of speech that's a little, uh, that we haven't talked about as much. It's not metaphor, it's not simile here. What she's using is something called paradox and pun. 
All right, so she punt, she uses the words in the poem, uh, defines them and redefines them uh, in parallel structure, which we'll unpack in just a second, uh, but using this device called pun in a paradox, okay? Um, so uh, it requires a discerning eye uh, to interpret what Dickinson is saying, and I think you'll find this poem uh, quite delightful um, whenever we uh, unpack its meaning, okay? Or at least I hope you do. So um, the poem, Much Madness is Divinest Sense, uh, we're going to analyze quickly and closely. Uh, but before we do that, as always, we want to conduct an SQ3R, a brief SQ3R uh, that's going to help us develop a basic comprehension of uh, what the poem has, has said before we get into a close analysis of what the poem means. All right. So as always, when we're doing our pre-reading in SQ3R, we want to conduct a kind of surveillance, that's what the S stands for, of the speaker, the genre, and the title. All right. The speaker uh, is simply uh, a thoughtful social outsider who, uh, importantly, is a person of belief or a person of faith. Uh, this individual does not have what we would call a materialistic worldview. All right. Um, now, importantly, uh, I want to draw a quick distinction here. Um, I am a person of faith. Okay, I, I am. I am a Christian. That's that. Uh, I'm a person who operates according to my uh, like my moral system uh, is is derivative of the law of God. Okay, and God is a supernatural transcendent force in the Christian worldview uh, who imposes um, moral order on the universe and the creatures that live in that universe are then therefore morally responsible to adapt to and live in light of right those moral structures okay now obviously Christianity is more than just about morality but but that's an important distinction to make okay uh, Emily Dickinson uh, is also a person of faith, but she's a romantic. All right, she's much more. Her worldview would be much more closely aligned with, say, uh, Emerson or perhaps Steinbeck, right? Who are skeptical of traditional or conventional and orthodox forms of belief, like, say, Christianity, but all right, are believers in transcendent spiritual realities nonetheless. Okay, so while we do not uh, share in an ultimate sense. Uh, commonalities and worldview with Dickinson, the speaker of the poem is you can you, uh, we can assert a, a kind of person of faith, all right, a person who believes in spiritual realities, and that alters her worldview significantly. Okay, let's talk quickly about the genre and the structure of the poem. Okay, it's a lyric poem, uh, which is to say it's just a poem that meditates on a on a sort of coherent topic spoken by one. Uh, individual speaker, all right, uh, and it's meditating on. I don't know if you're familiar with a, a, a philosopher, a utilitarian philosopher from the 19th century named John Stuart Mill, but uh, he, she, the, the speaker is meditating on this concept that John Stuart Mill would refer to as the tyranny of the majority. Maybe you've come across that language in maybe like an AP Euro class or an AP US class. I'm not sure. Um, which he used that concept, the tyranny of the majority, all right, to describe a kind of social tyranny that altered an individual's ideology, what they believe about the world, and how their conscious mind is shaped by the environment in which they live. All right. So the tyranny, of, uh, the tyranny of the majority alters an individual's ideology by implying, all right, that that which is socially normal. And that which is socially acceptable is also necessarily good. All right. Now, when you spell that out, that's obviously not true. But in terms of the way that we as social creatures typically operate, all right, you, you could think back to say Ethan Frome. All right. When we think about the way that we typically operate as social creatures, we tend to, as human beings and as social animals. Uh, uh, establish a kind of ready connection between that which is normal and acceptable in our society with that which is good. All right? And it also, the tyranny majority, uh, asserts that implicitly that which is abnormal and different is also bad. Okay? So the poem uh, is structured in open form or free verse. Okay? So we do not have a conventional 
uh, uh, rhythm or meter that is followed here. This isn't a sonnet uh, or a, a villanelle um, or a haiku, uh, traditional conventional structures of poetic expression, but rather what we would call free verse or open form. Uh, and Dickinson uses this irregularity of meter and structure as a reflection of the liberty of the speaker. Okay, so again, that makes sense, right? All right, so what's the title? Much Madness is Divinest Sense. Now, we'll get into the significance of the, that assertion, which is paradoxical in nature. Something that is uh, mad or insane cannot be sensible at the same time, denotatively or literally. It's clearly something that requires a discerning eye to understand. It's clearly something to, that, that requires uh, interpretation and uh, acknowledgement of the paradox. Okay, so let's go ahead and read the poem, uh, recite its meaning, and then quickly uh, review the main idea that is communicated. All right, so before we get into analysis, let's just read the poem. Okay, uh, first line Much madness is divinest sense to a discerning eye. That is to say, that many things that seem crazy are actually divinely or uh, are especially true to a person with a discerning eye, okay? And then in parallel form, much since the starkest madness. So much of the things that seem to make sense to the majority, the starkest, which is to say obvious, uh, obviously crazy. Tis the majority. The majority here, just a capital M majority, just refers to uh, society at large or the majority of, of human individuals. Tis the majority in this. This refers to this process of defining that which is mad and that which makes sense. In this, as all, prevails. Okay. So who prevails, who gets to define that which is mad and that which makes sense? A perspective that is insane and disconnected from reality and a perspective that is sane and sensible and, and, and makes sense, is rational in light of the premises uh, that we have established. Um, uh, that process is governed over by uh, the majority the speaker recognizes. Assent, which means to say that something is true, literally, assent, and you are sane, okay? Demure, demure is a word that simply means to question. Demure, to question that reality. And you're straight away, right away, you're dangerous, you're a danger, and handled with a capital C, chain. All right? So, uh, let's unpack uh, in our next 15 minutes or so how Dickinson uses poetic devices all right, to develop the thematic impression of the poem. That's our central question here. How does the speaker's style develop the thematic impression or the main idea of what the speaker uh, 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 or Dickinson is trying to get at? Okay, well, let's go line by line. All right, first word, much. Okay, uh, much madness is divine essence. So, so the word much, all right, Dickinson is punning on the meaning of the word much, which in this context can mean kind of two things. Number one, a great deal, like, uh, like uh, an extreme amount, uh, a great deal of madness, or, okay, often or many times, right, like much of the time or many times, madness. Okay, madness here, it, the, the word capital M is used as a synecdoche. Synecdoche is a form of figurative language that uses a part to represent a whole. Okay, so here the capital M madness or the word madness is used as a synecdoche for any form of aberrant action or belief. Aberrant just means uh, anything abnormal or that uh, moves away from. Uh, the, the kind of line of that which is normal, that which is acceptable, uh, that which is expected, okay? Now, the word madness uh, literally means insanity, okay? So what is insanity? What does it mean to be insane? It's someone who ha who has, whose um, psychological processing is distant from or disconnected from reality. All right. It's insane to think that you can fly 
and to jump off a cliff, you're going to fall and you're going to die. That's an insane thought. All right. So madness here refers to a way of viewing the world that is uh, that does not uh, adhere to uh, reality. Okay. Uh, the root of the word, right? Uh, mad also connotes a sense of dissatisfaction. Okay. Uh, as if the, the mad person or uh, the person who believes that some things that are insane in the eyes of the majority all right, is indeed divine sense. That person is oftentimes motivated by a kind of dissatisfaction with the status quo, a dissatisfaction with worldly materialistic ideas. Okay? So the word is here, all right, the word is, simply establishes an equation that is impossible to be literally true. All right? The word is means that madness is sense. That's impossible. Which means that the line is meant to be read A, figuratively, B, paradoxically, and C can only be understood by, guess who? The discerning eye. The person who is willing to peel back the layers of the language and understand what the paradox connotes because it denotes something that seems rather mad, rather insane. Okay? So much madness is divinest sense. All right? So divinest, the word divine obviously refers to all right, a kind of divine or supernatural form of knowing. All right? Divinest sense. It's a form of knowing that is sensible and real to a person of faith, but is completely inaccessible to a person without faith. Okay? It reminds me of the biblical passage, uh, passage likening knowledge of the gospel to foolishness for those who do not believe. All right? Here, Dickinson uh, playing on that concept reckons with the fact that, that for those who are people of faith, right, that faith, that divinest sense is indeed sensible. All right, reminds me of Jim Casey. It's indeed something that makes sense. It's indeed something that can be, that is very real. All right? But for the person that lacks faith, uh, it is completely insane. It is completely inaccessible. Okay? So when put together, the line signals all right, that extreme amounts of insanity, living as though, say, for instance, the gospel is true, is extremely insane for those that reject the supernatural for those that do not live as if the supernatural is sensible. But for those that do, this kind of madness is totally reasonable. All right? Okay. Who is it reasonable to? It is reasonable to a discerning I. All right, so uh, the article here, A, and the uh, singular I, Emphasize, okay, obviously, I is a synecdoche for the person with a worldview that is unique, A, that is aberrant from the materialistic worldview or the materialist eyes of the majority, all right? And in order to emphasize the uniqueness or individuality or set-apartness of the individual who operates according to divine sense instead of the majority's sense, right? the speaker, again, uses the singular form of I and emphasizes that singularity with the, the article A, to A, discerning I. Okay. Much sense, here this is a, a parallel inversion of the above statement, right? So sense, which comes at the end of this line, comes at the beginning of this line, all right? So much here 
is meant to mean the same as the capital M much up above. In other words, it's punning on both all right, a great deal of and often or many times or normally. So that which seems extremely sensible to the majority is the starkest madness to the discerning eye. Stark, all right, remember stark field from Ethan Frome, is a word that just evokes a sense of emptiness, all right, and also obviousness. It's the starkest, it's the most obvious insanity to the individual who operates from a worldview based on belief in the divine, based on belief in the supernatural. Okay, so the parallel structure here, right? You guys see the parallel structure, the repeated grammatical construction. Much madness is divine sense, much sense the starkest madness. Okay, this parallel structure, which is inverted, all right, emphasizes the complete opposition between these two perspectives. All right, those who operate as if there is nothing to believe in. All right, those who operate according to materialist presuppositions, all right, believe that which makes sense, okay, is completely in an oppositional relationship to those uh, people of faith, right? Uh, the sense to them is completely different. The word sense here is redefined, okay? just as the word madness here is redefined. They are inverted. They are flipped. Okay? The poet continues, "'Tis the majority." All right? It is the majority in this as all prevail. Okay? So uh, the, the, the combination of this word majority and the use of the word all here evokes this sense in which the all-encompassing majority, the all-encompassing uh, hegemony. Hegemony just the word that means uh, control over, uh, unquestioned control over. The all-encompassing hegemony or omnipotence uh, of the majority prevails in the definition of that which is sane. Okay, The only person who can escape this kind of ideological control is, ready, the discerning eye the set-apart, singular, uh, critical evaluator, okay, the discerning eye. All right. Tis the majority in this, as all prevail. Okay. Ascent, and you are sane. Obviously, like I said earlier, ascent just means to agree. Now, typically the word ascent is used in context so, so uh, that are religious. You assent to a certain uh, dogma or belief system. You assent to certain philosophical doctrines or ethical standards. Okay, So the word has this kind of religious connotation. If you religiously agree with the majority's notion of reality, the majority's materialistic sensibilities that are so often the norm in the world. Okay, so the majority should be read with the same kind of suggestive meaning as the biblical world or the Pauline world. Why? Because most people, the speaker implies, most human individuals operate as if Okay, operate as if this divine sense doesn't actually exist. Okay, they might confess that it does, but the way that they structure their societies, the way that they go about their days, the way that what they pursue, all right, on a daily basis testifies to the fact that they, along with the majority of the human species, believe that living in pursuit of divine truths is simply insane. Assent, and you are sane. You are labeled sane. The word assent also puns on the, the, uh, a word that sounds like it, the word ascend, 
which is which means to go up, to move up, to be enlightened, to occupy a space of higher moral and intellectual standing. Okay, so this is obviously that 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 pun is ironic. Because for the person who does not believe that this is true, right, they are living a deeply worldly, uh, a deeply unenlightened uh, uh, form of life. But this, by the majority, is described as something that is good, something that gives you moral high ground, something that's sane, something that makes you safe. Demure. Now, that's an interesting word because it does not say deny. Okay, it does not even say reject, it just says demure. And the word demure literally means it denotes questioning. Okay? Now, the, the prefix D in English uh, comes from the Latin word that means down from. So if you move down from this typical ascent, if you refuse to ascend to the majority's notion of sanity, then what, hap what, what, what happens if you just raise the question? Well, you're a threat. You're straight away dangerous. Okay? Again, the parallel structure of these two lines emphasizes the distance between these two approaches, those that assent and those that demure. Okay? Those that are sane and those that are crazy, those that are mad. Right? And the final line, and handled with a chain. Okay? The capital C chain here, once again, uh, is a synecdoche. All right, chain. Uh, obviously, you chain up someone uh, during this period of time. Okay, mental uh, uh, mental illness and insanity. Uh, people who were mentally ill or insane weren't treated super nice. Uh, they were typically chained up uh, in uh, insane asylums. Okay, so uh, we don't really do that uh, quite as aggressively anymore. Uh, but obviously, right here, what the speaker is using this chain, all right, uh, as a synecdoche for is all the ways in which the majority enchains the consciousness and the ideology of an individual. So how does how does a society enchain one's ideology? Well, through education, through the tyranny of the majority, through labeling forms of life that operate according to divine sensibilities instead of material sensibilities, uh, labeling them as insane, labeling them as fanatics, labeling them as people who are dangers to social flourishing and social harmony. Okay, you are handled with a chain. You are re, -edu you are re educated. Okay. Now, interestingly, right, uh, the the uh, uh, a notable rhyme uh, in the poem. There's not a lot of rhyme that happens in the poem, but there is uh, a, a rhyme here between the word "sane" and "chain." Here, uh, in that uh, in the rhyme between these two words, the speaker subtly suggests, all right, that even though it is those that operate according to divine sense that are typically enchained, that it is the sane, all right, or the sane, right, the quote-unquote sane, that are actually enchained to a stark, insane, empty worldview. Okay? So, uh, what is the poem getting at, generally speaking? Well, let's, let's take a quick look at this uh, interpretive thesis statement. As a whole, the poem suggests that socially constructed materialistic understandings of truth and reality okay, are at odds with supernatural understandings of truth and reality. This is a notion that is definitely supported in the New Testament, right? and also the Old Testament, all throughout the Bible. Okay. People of faith operate according to a different understanding of reality than people who operate according to a materialistic understanding of reality. This is one of the major themes of a book that you're reading right now called Don't Waste Your Life. Uh, the book Don't Waste Your Life I read uh, when I was a senior in high school, and it changed my life. I'm not even kidding. It changed my life. Um, so uh, uh, supernatural understandings of truth and reality 
and questioning the tyrannical majority's materialism while perfectly reasonable for the perfect uh, person of faith. This is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Okay? This reminds me of the misfit. Uh, it, it is, it, if Jesus indeed died and rose again and conquered death, then you have nothing to do. Uh, it, it is unreasonable, it is irrational for you to do anything other than, than sell all you have and follow him, okay? Uh, like, the, the, like the rich young ruler was incapable of doing, okay? Uh, while it's perfectly reasonable for the person of, person of faith is considered a threat to society's control over sanity. They're a threat. They are insane. They do not align with a materialistic understanding of reality. Okay? The speaker illustrates this deep conflict between these two worldviews through her use of pun, parallelism, and synecdoche to define and then redefine the meaning of madness and sense depending on the I of the individual. Okay? Um, or uh, perhaps a better way of saying that, depending on whether one sees through their own eye or through the eyes of the all-encompassing majority. Okay? Um, I think this poem is particularly resonant uh, for uh, the young Christian, uh, in, especially in an increasingly materialistic uh, culture uh, that tends to assert that, that living as if there are divine truths worth staking your life on is insane. It's, it's too far. Okay? Sure, you can be a person of faith, but, but don't be insane about it. Right? Um, well, if uh, these things are indeed true, then it is insane to live as if they are not and to live as if they are not all consuming realities. Um, so, Much Madness is Divinest Sense, um, a lyric poem that talks about the uh, inherent oppositions between materialist uh, and supernatural understandings of the world uh, and the ways in which the tyranny of the majority attempts to cast aberrant belief systems, specifically those who believe in divine truths, who sense the divine and supernatural as crazy, as insane. All right, uh, have a great day. Hope you guys are doing well.